back up. First slide. Aaron. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Good morning. Hope you all are doing well. Thank you all for joining us, sharing time and space. Um, my name is Aaron. I am one of CCP's peer advisors and a committee member who helped plan this webinar. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us for our first ever Power to the Southeast Asian Transfer Experience. Y'all are making history by being here, and we really appreciate you coming. Next slide. Thanks, Blanca. Uh, before we begin our day together, um, I just want to let y'all know that this meeting will be recorded and put on YouTube. So do whatever you need to do to feel as comfortable as possible. Uh, and feel free to turn off your camera and, you know, use the chat and the reactions to, you know, interact with us. Um, today, we have an amazing program prepared for you. Um, after we're done with our introductions this morning, we will have amazing presentations on Southeast Asian historical context, you know, who makes up the Southeast Asian community. We're going to have presentations on the model minority myth, how being lumped into one category can be harmful to our individual communities and an amazing student-led advocacy project at UCLA's campus. And these presentations will be done by our extraordinary faculty and students. Um, next slide, please. We also have set up a web page for y'all where you can find everything about this event. Uh, the cool Zoom backgrounds our committee members have made, um, the biographies on our presenters in case you want to learn more about them and connect with them and the recordings and so much more information. So feel free to scan this QR code um, to access all this info. Next slide, please. And then we also have set up a group me for, the, for this cohort. So please feel free to join it. Uh, you can scan the QR code or visit the link on the screen. We'll be sharing resources to this cohort throughout the academic year. And we'll also all be available to answer your questions whenever they pop up about the transfer experience or, you know, whatever you're curious about regarding higher education. The next slide, please. Now I'm going to hand it off to Alfred. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are very excited to be here today to share with you some really important information in our work with students. We are um, extremely excited to have um, this first ever and not the last um, transfer session focused on Southeast Asian students. It is important for us to be able to provide as much support and assistance to you as you make your way on your journey through uh, higher education. Our work here is critical in that it helps prepare our communities to enter the university and to be um, successful and to excel. Um, being a part of CCP over the year allows you an opportunity to engage in Zoom uh, webinars and meetings, hopefully very soon in-person meetings to connect with students like yourselves and to participate in, in numerous activities throughout the year to help prepare you to be competitive and again to be a successful transfer student. We pride ourselves in being able to really work closely with you to help you to help guide you through that process. So um, if you are interested in becoming a CCP scholar, please fill out the information and you'll you'll get more information about it throughout the day. But it's important that you continue to connect. One of the other things that's really important is to make sure that you ask a lot of questions. We are here to provide information. And so we know that you came here for specific reasons and we want to make sure that we can provide answers to the questions that you have and to follow up with you. So enjoy the day. It's going to be rich with great information and good people. And we thank you for joining us. Next slide. Brandon, are you here? I don't know if Brandon has made it in yet. So let's go ahead and meet the uh, the South uh, Power to the Southeast Asian uh, Committee. You've met me. Jewel Bourne is uh, one of our program coordinators and is not able to be here, but Jewel has had a 
been very instrumental in providing support to the uh, group. Blanca. Good morning uh, to everyone and welcome to this year your space, your community. Uh, my name is Blanca Cantara Hershey. I am the um, office coordinator as well as the communication school coordinator along Jewel um, and another peer advisor, Daniel. Um, I'm a product of CCCP. I transferred from Santa Monica College to UCLA, graduated in 2014. It's a long time. <laughs> and I'm just glad to be back um, here working for the center con to continue the work, um, you know, working with the transfer community. So once again, like Alfred said, ask questions and we're here for you. So please see us as part of your transfer community. Once again, welcome. Aaron. Hello again, everybody. Uh, my name is Aaron. Again, <laughs> I'm from Baldwin Park, California. Uh, fun fact, home of the first in and out uh, I'm a communication major and a second year transfer student from Citrus College, as well as a peer advisor for the Center for Community College Partnerships. And again, I welcome you all and thank you all for sharing space with us. I'm not sure Brandon is here. Um, Brandon Lee is an undergrad student and was a scholar in CCP's program and is now a, uh, again, an undergrad student here and he'll probably be joining us shortly. Jade. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Jade Alboro and I'm the librarian for Southeast Asian Studies and Pacific Island Studies here at UCLA. And Melissa. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Melissa Velus Abraham. She, her, hers are my pronouns. And I'm an advisor at the Student Organization's Leadership and Engagement Office. And I advise a lot of um, the Southeast Asian student organizations here on campus. So you've met some of our staff. Um, I'll ask the others to um, introduce themselves briefly. Alberto. Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to your space. My name is Alberto Moreno. Feel free to call me Beto for short. Um, I am a program coordinator with the center overseeing our partnership with Los Angeles Pierce College. So shout out to everyone, all the Brahmas in the room. Um, welcome everyone, ask a lot of questions, uh, learn a lot. Um, and I also want to take uh, thank the planning committee for putting together our first ever Southeast Asian um, webinar. Again, welcome and enjoy today. Thank you. I don't know if Perla's in the house. She is in the house. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Perla Partida. I am the coordinator for LACC and LA Harbor um, colleges. So welcome, welcome. I myself um, am a transfer student as well. And I'm also from Baldwin Park, so whoop, whoop. And I'm just grateful that you all are here. I was a scholar myself in the program and then a peer advisor. So any questions, um, just let me know. And I'm, I'm here to help you um, with anything that you need. Enjoy the day. And she's also a parenting student. But I'm, and I'm also from Baldwin Park, just so you all know, there are three of us. Claudia. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Claudia Salcedo and I'm CCCP's administrative coordinator and I am not from Baldwin Park. I'm actually from the Coachella <laughs> Valley from Indio, California. <laughs> so if anyone knows where that's at, you know, send me a shout out on your chat. <laughs> so I say good morning to everyone. Happy to be here and enjoy the day, enjoy the webinar and the space. Thank you, Ariel. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Arielle. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the program coordinator for CCP over at West Los Angeles College and LA Southwest College. Um, so shout out to any students from there. Uh, I transferred from Pasadena City College. So shout out to my Lancers. Um, and I transferred over to UCLA with the help of CCCP. Now I'm working back here full-time staff. Um, and I just want to say welcome, 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 and congrats on being part of the inaugural group for this um, webinar. So congrats to you and congrats to the planning committee. Thank you, Gabby. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm very excited to be here with you in community. My name is Gabriela Abraham, and I'm a program representative for the Center for Community College Partnership. I'm a first generation and traditional parenting student. I transferred from Los Angeles Valley College to UCLA in 2014, graduated in 2017. I'm also a first generation immigrant from Puebla, Mexico. And thank you for being here and enjoy the webinar. Thank you. Blanca introduced herself already. Cinnamon is uh, on her way to law school. So she has left our office uh, recently and we wish her well. Frank. Thank you, Alfred. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to your webinar. My name is Frank Castorena, Jr. I am a program coordinator here at the Center for Community College Partnerships, and I oversee the partnerships between Los Angeles Trade Tech and Los Angeles Mission College. I am a proud uh, transfer student from the best community college in Los Angeles, East Los Angeles College. Uh, and I just wanna welcome everyone. Please ask a lot of questions. Uh, write down uh, emails if people share them, start networking, it's really important. Uh, and welcome once again. Thank you, Santi. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm very excited about this webinar and, and just having community with you all here. Uh, myself, uh, Santiago Bernal, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. And one thing I think that um, for a lot of us is that uh, we have different migration um, um, reasons, right? Uh, and, and, and in many cases are economic, uh, political, or what have you. But for most of us, it has to do with the fact that the US was in our countries um, and uh, disrupting our own um, lives uh, and, and you know, pushing us into the diaspora. So I, I am so excited to be here to be able to walk along with you uh, along this journey and hope to continue to work with you as you move along through the community college, as you move along to the university, graduate, and, and so on. So thank you for having us here. Thank you. Chelly. Hi, everyone. I am Chelly Gonzalez, program coordinator at CCP, overseeing the East Delhi College Partnership. So shout out to any Huskies in the house. Um, also, I was a transfer student, first gen um, from Santa Barbara City College. To shout out to anyone from the 805, thank you for being here today. I'm looking forward to great uh, programming and information and building community. Aurelia? Um, okay, so Aurelia is, uh, Reimer is uh, a former, well, she's a scholar. She was a scholar when she was a student at Santa Monica College. She is now overseeing our STEM partnership. So if you are a STEM major, you'll want to connect with uh, Aurelia as well. Thank you. Next slide. The Center for Community College Partnerships at UCLA acknowledged the Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tawangar, the, the Los Angeles Basin, and Southern Channel Islands, and are grateful to have the opportunity to work for the indigenous peoples in this place. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and our relatives' relations past, present, and emerging.
So the next slides um, might trigger some um, feelings of uncomfortableness based on what we know has been happening in our communities. So we just wanted to uh, allow you time to um, do what you need to do to feel more comfortable and either shut down your camera or anything that you feel that you need to do. So we'll move on. To our students and colleagues in the Black community and across the diaspora, we stand with you. You are valued and an important member of our campus and off-campus family. We all need to acknowledge the challenges and work to change them. We must work together as people of color and allies, people who are concerned about our future to eliminate these systemic disparities. We take a stand today and always because Black Lives Matter. Triple C statement um, on stop API hate is that Triple CP condemns hateful acts of violence, harassment, and rhetoric targeting Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and Desi Americans. Since the beginning of the alarm of the COVID-19 pandemic, there has been an alarming increase in the discrimination and violence perpetrated on the APIDA community. These acts of violence are nothing new. We are we are disturbed by these xenophobic, racially motivated attacks. Triple CP stands in solidarity with all of our students, colleagues, and partners who experience marginalization and threat. All right, so um, in terms of the pandemic's impact, the death rate for Latino people is 21% um, and for Black people is 9% higher than statewide. Um, case rate for communities with median income of 40,000 um, is 37% higher than statewide. Um, community college students have the largest negative impact, particularly men of color who have experienced large enrollment drops. Um, in terms of UCLA returning to campus for fall 2021, close to 80% of courses would be offered in person as well as most labs. UCs will require anyone accessing UC facilities or in-person UC programs to be fully vaccinated prior to fall term. UCLA is planning for on-campus housing this fall and expects to offer housing to first-year transfers and to a high percentage of second-year transfers. Um, and Los Angeles has mandated masks into effect and that started in July 17th. Uh, hello, everyone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about critical race theory in education. Uh, so it's critical race theory. It's one of our uh, the main theoretical framework that CCP uses. Uh, so this also called CRT, CRT in education. So CRT originally came out of legal scholars. Uh, CRT explains how structural and racial disparities persist in American society. Uh, so CCP uses CRT as a tool to explore the disparities along the community college educational pipeline. Uh, so CRT recognizes that systemic racism does exist, and all we have to do is look at how some laws and policies and policies that are supposed to be neutral actually promote racial disparities. And there are five tenets <clears throat> in CRT. The first one is its centrality of race and racism. It challenges the dominant ide ideology. So the dominant ideology really focuses on deficit thinking. Uh, it also it's it says like the reason why certain groups are not excelling in education is because they lack certain things they're not smart enough they're lacking resources but it's not really that it's that uh the policies in place have made it harder for certain populations to get to uh where they need to go to uh the third thing is that it values explorational knowledge so then the you your experience matter, right? And so CRT says that what you're bringing with you is really important. Uh, the, the fourth thing is that it's interdisciplinary. So originally it came from uh, law, from law, but a lot of di different disciplines uh, picked it up. So in education, higher education, so uh, higher ed, sociology, history, uh, different disciplines have used it and it also focused on intersectionality and so intersectionality is basically students have more than one identity 
And so they have multiple identities, whether it's your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, first generation, low income, and all those come together. So it's saying that uh, you're not we're not focusing on one identity, but we want you to bring all of you because all of you are important. And so the last thing is that it's a commitment to social justice. And so this is just a brief uh, introduction into what critical race theory is. I know that they just shared a, a link to an article on CRT. So if you want more information, please go to that link and read the article. And I'm also going to be talking about the second framework that CCP uses, which is community culture wealth, uh, which was developed by Dr. Tara Yasso. And so here, community culture wealth, it's saying instead of focusing on the deficits, we're looking at the strengths that that we as as a uh, students have, right? And so it's it's saying that we might not have. Uh, financial capital or we might not come from money but we all but we do have a lot of cultural wealth or cultural capital and the first one that it focuses is on linguistic and so linguistics capital uh a lot of us are either bilingual trilingual and we've been using this capital sometimes when we're young sometimes we're interpreting for our parents whether it's at school whether it's at an important meeting but it linguistics also focuses on the art of storytelling right so being able to share stories with your elders with your grandparents with your cousins with your family right it's that oral history that's being passed down uh, aspirational capital means that even though we know that there's barriers uh uh in our way we still have our aspirations and dreams and we're going to figure out a way to get to our goals and then we have familial capital whether that's our biological family or, or our logical family the people that we make our family where we uh are able to ask for help uh, they provide us with uh resources this is where we get our values and norms and societal uh Societal is like being part of CCP, right? But it's also your friends. It's also part of networking. Uh, and then we have navigational capital, which it's saying that even though <clears throat> we may not uh, know how to, we might not have the experience of navigating certain places like higher education, we still, we're still able to do it, right? We're still able to navigate through, through whatever uh, places that we go and so then we have resistant capital and this is something that as people of color we are doing this we've been doing this since uh, the civil rights movements through all the power movements which is the the chicano movement the black uh panther movement the asian american movement the native american movements all those movements the civil rights movements uh this is something that we do even being here uh, in this call is part of being resistant, being uh, going to community college or higher education is a form of resistant capital because uh, these institutions were not originally made for us, but we're here, we're persisting and we're getting through what we have to do. And so this is community culture capital, right? It's focusing on your strengths and not your deficits. So we are full of wealth folks. Uh, so once you start learning your, your cultural capital is gonna make you a better person. Uh, all right, that's, that's it. So these are just a few of our community guidelines and things to follow while we're spending our time here together today. Um, so just remember to respect the cyber community. Um, please make sure that your microphones are muted um, and then click on speaker view so that you're able to see um, all of our presenters. Um, if you have any questions throughout the entire presentation, you can utilize our chat feature and someone will um, make sure to get back with you or um, flag your question for a little later on. Um, your questions will be answered during a Q&A portion um, and yeah, thank you. And we also wanna remind you just um, don't be afraid to ask any questions, challenge ideas, not the messenger. So this is our agenda for the day, just to give you a, a look at the overview. Next slide. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm once again. I'm Jade Alboro. I'm the librarian for Southeast Asian Studies and Pacific Island Studies here at UCLA. And I just want to um, 
tell you that you should go seek out your librarians wherever you are, whether you're in your community college or when you go to a four-year institution because they can help you to be successful in your schoolwork. Um, and I am also I am an immigrant originally from the Philippines, and um, I am here to introduce Dr. Evan Le Espiritu Gandhi. She is an assistant professor at the UCLA Asian American Studies Department. And she um, does work that is interdisciplinary and touches on uh, critical refugee studies and post um, transnational studies and settler, colon settler colonial studies. And she will be talking to you as about the historical context of Southeast Asia and Southeast Asians in America. Um, so welcome, Dr. Evan Lay, Spirit to Gandhi. Thank you so much, Jade, and thank you so much to CCCP for hosting this event. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I'm relatively new to UCLA. I've been here since 2019, um, but I'm so excited to meet you. So go ahead and give me a shout out um, in the chat. You know, tell me where you're calling in from. Um, and I'm going to talk about historical context today. So if you want to tell me also where your family's from, you know, let us know um, kind of your histories and how you got to this moment. So I'm going to go ahead um, and share screen. I have a quick PowerPoint. All right, I hope you all can see that. So again, you know, feel free to um, post your questions and give your shout out in the chat. Um, I love to hear from you, but I'll also open it up um, from Q&A at the end. So this is, um, as you know, the power to the Southeast Asian Transfer Experience webinar. Um, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about historical context. Um, first, I just want to, you know, acknowledge that Southeast Asians are really in the media, right? Um, folks are talking about this sort of aspirational, who are our models? Um, and so definitely the Olympics are something that's on my mind. Um, we saw SUNY Lee, um, of course, win in gymnastics. That was really exciting for me to watch. But thinking also about the Hmong community that produced her and that supported her, right? Thinking again about those cultural and familial resources. Um, you might have also heard about Jordan Windle. Um, Jordan Windle placed fourth um, in the diving. Um, but again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the context of Cambodians, right, and how the Cambodian Civil War, as well as U.S. intervention during the Cold War, um, also influenced his history um, and how that made him an orphan, but also led to his adoption um, by uh, Jerry Windle. How he then again also made it to the Olympics, which is really exciting. Um, this has also come up in the news a lot too, right? Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about my family history, but just to preview, um, my mom and grandmother were actually Vietnamese refugees um, who left Saigon in 1975. Um, and so I'm also really thinking about the resonances with what's happening today in Afghanistan um, and the fall of Kabul. Um, and really thinking about the moral obligation of the United States um, as a military force that had been in the region for so long um, to accept these refugees and really deal with the refugee situation. Who are the people that are being forcibly displaced um, from Afghanistan now? And what parallels do we see um, with the Vietnamese refugee case um, several decades earlier? So these are things, again, that are sort of resonating in the contemporary moment um, and make this historical context of thinking about um, Southeast Asian history um, and Southeast Asian diasporic history really important. Um, so here's just a, a map of Southeast Asia. Um, so sort of some guiding questions for us to think about. So where did we come from? How did we get here? You know, here also understood very broadly and imaginatively. Um, and I'm going to highlight a couple key themes. So I really want to think about war, um, U.S. imperialism, and also post-colonial struggle um, as some of the key historical themes that really inform our migration histories. Um, and I just want to say the caveat that, you know, this uh, presentation is only 45 minutes, so it's not going to be overly comprehensive, right? But I really want to emphasize some key points and really share them through my own family history um, as a way to ground this presentation. Okay, so just a little bit more about me to start us off. Um, so I am from uh, North County. Give us a shout out if you're from Oceanside as well um, on the Kumeyaay lands. So this is a picture of me when I was young. And I'm a second generation Vietnamese Filipina. 
Um, so what that means is that my dad's family um, are immigrants from the Philippines. My dad came to California when he was around seven. Um, and then, as I mentioned, my mom and grandmother are refugees from Vietnam. They left in April 1975. Um, my mom was about 12 years old um, when she first came to California. Um, and they actually met at UC San Diego. Um, I went to college uh, in the LA area, east of LA at Pomona College. Um, and there I majored in history and media studies. Um, and then I did my PhD up in NorCal um, on Ohlone lands at UC Berkeley. So I did my PhD um, in rhetoric. I worked with a Vietnamese American uh, filmmaker and feminist theorist, Trin Chi Minh Ha, and I'll be featuring uh, some of her work later on in this presentation as well. Um, I actually taught uh, on the East Coast for a little bit. So I taught at Tufts University and College of the Holy Cross before coming to UCLA in 2019, right before the pandemic started. Um, and uh, just to highlight, I have written a book that's forthcoming next year, um, and it's called Archipelago of Resettlement, Vietnamese Refugee Settlers and Decolonization Across Guam and Israel Palestine. So in my research, it's really informed also by my personal history and my family's migration histories. Um, I'm really interested in looking at Vietnamese refugees and other parts of the world um, and thinking about Southeast Asian refugee subjectivity in relation to ongoing indigenous sovereignty movements for decolonization. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, and then I'm going to sort of dive more into this historical context. So let's talk a little bit more um, first about the Philippines. So as I mentioned, my dad's family's from the Philippines. They're from Pangasinan, which is up here. You can see in this map. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the sort of colonial history of the Philippines, right? And also how it informs our contemporary subjectivities. Um, so the Spanish colonial period was actually for a long time, multiple centuries from 1521 to 1898. Um, so we have a strong Spanish uh, Catholic influence, Spanish names. Um, so my dad's name is Jesus Abraham Espiritu, which I think really epitomizes this point. Um, so Espiritu uh, is my family maiden name. 1521, you know, is when Ferdinand Magellan declared the Philippines a colony of the Spanish Empire. So we can also think about this history as one as, as a long-term resistance, right? So thinking about Filipino survival um, and also resistance during this long, many centuries uh, of colonialism and Spanish empire, um, which then leads to the US takeover and sort of US influence in the Philippines. So first we have the 1898 Philippine revolution. Um, so Filipino nationalists um, really stood up and rebelled against the Spanish colonial um, influence the Spanish as an occupying colonial power. Um, this though then actually led to a protracted war, right? So it actually led to the Philippine-American War, which you might've heard of from 1899 to 1902. So the US you know, initially uh, fought alongside Filipino national liberation fighters against the Spanish colonists. Um, but once Spain was defeated, the US actually turned um, and they colonized the Philippines. Um, so it was a very uneasy alliance um, and many Filipino nationalists felt that they were betrayed um, by the United States military, um, which they thought were fighting alongside them, but actually had their own imperial interests in mind. During um, the sort of American occupation of the Philippines or American presence, they built a lot of US military bases, some of which are still ongoing today. So there's a big sort of US commercial, but also military presence still in the Philippines that really informs the Filipino migrational routes to the United States as well as around the world. So we can think about Clark Air Force Base, uh, Subic Naval Base, um, interesting thing is that Clark Air Force Base also played a really key role during the Vietnam War, as well as during the Vietnamese refugee exodus in 1975. Um, finally, we have Philippine independence on July 4th, 1946. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of scholars have written about the continual neo-colonial relations. Um, so even though the Philippines has formal independence, there's still a lot of economic independence, still strong cultural influences from places like the United States um, that again really uh, compels a lot of Filipinos to migrate to the United States. There's a lot of course, a lot of Filipino nurses who are working here, um, very much working and contributing to helping the COVID crisis. 
Um, so we can think about, again, how these historical relations and that how these histories are informing our present, are informing how our, our families got here, and perhaps why they chose the United States as their declaration, their destination. You can also think about the sort of remittance culture. I'm sure a lot of you um, who have families who are still in the Philippines, there's that circulation of earnings and wealth, right? So sending a lot of uh, earnings um, back to the Philippines also to support family who still lives in the Philippines. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit now about Vietnam. So as I mentioned, my mom's side of the family is from Vietnam. And I wanna start with this uh, beautiful image from Trinh Minh Minh Hoc, who I mentioned was one of my key mentors um, while I was doing my graduate work at UC Berkeley. Um, so this is a still from her film, Forgetting Vietnam. Um, which really talks about the ongoing influence of the Vietnam War on Vietnamese culture, as well as Vietnamese diaspora culture. So Trinh Chi Minh Ha talks about how she uh, first started filming this, um, this film in 1995, um, but then she goes back later in the 2000s, um, and you can really see her different like media technology and how that's juxtaposed. Um, but thinking about how her as someone who's been living abroad in the United States and also in France, what it means to come back to Vietnam, right? And how the war continues to shape the landscape and the people. Okay. So we also have a, a long history of European colonialism in Vietnam as well. So French colonialism in Southeast Asia, um, really, you know, there's different uh, historical trajectories, but we can really pinpoint it in the 1880s to the 1950s, sort of broadly. Um, French Indochina included not only Vietnam, but also Laos and Cambodia. So we can see how these three countries' histories have very much been intertwined since this French colonial period. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about Laos and Cambodia um, as well in later slides. Um, another key date to sort of think about is the Battle of Ding Bing Phu. Uh, which happened in 1954. Um, and this was very much a Vietnamese victory uh, against the French colonial power. So the Viet Minh independence fighters defeat the French. Um, and on September 2nd, 1945, Ho Chi Minh proclaims the independence of the Democratic Republic of Vietnam in Hanoi. And one thing that I find really interesting is that he actually quotes the US Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal um, in this opening declaration. Um, this, of course, is very ironic in some ways, um, because the U.S. would then turn um, to sort of counteract um, Ho Chi Minh's uh, national movement. So after 1954 and the Geneva Convention, we also have Vietnam that's divided at the 17th parallel. And this is very much informed here by Cold War divisions. So thinking about the communist uh, North Vietnam um, that's also then backed um, and has a lot of Soviet influence as well as Chinese communist influence. And South Vietnam, we really have the US coming in to Vietnam thinking about this as a proxy war against communism. So the Vietnam War, also known as America's War in Vietnam then lasted two decades, 1955 to 1975. Um, and we can think about, again, these historical um, continuities, right? So how the history of French colonialism then sets the groundwork for U.S. intervention into Southeast Asia. So how the U.S. maybe takes off where the French left off. Um, so the U.S. then backs the South Vietnamese government against the North Vietnamese communists, as well as the Viet Cong, which is the National Liberation um, Front uh, based in South Vietnam. Um, and in 1973, we see the U.S. withdrawal of troops from Vietnam. This is under President Nixon. Um, he has a whole policy of Vietnamization. And a lot of the rhetoric was that, OK, we are going to now have the uh, South Vietnamese military um, sort of defend uh, South Vietnam and pull out U.S. military troops. Um, we saw a lot of rhetoric as well, similar to, again, what's happening in Afghanistan, the privileging, of course, of American lives, um, and therefore the need to pull out American military based on sort of domestic pushback. Um, but we also can see here um, that even as there was this rhetoric of scaling back in terms of troops, there was actually an escalation of the US um, air warfare bombing campaign um, against Vietnam, as well as against the surrounding Southeast Asian communities and countries, which of course leads to uh, multiple forms of displacement during this time period. 
Um, and this all culminates in uh, April 30th, 1975, where we have the fall of Saigon. Um, this is also known as Black April in a lot of Vietnamese diasporic communities. Um, and it's very much mourned as the fall of a country of South Vietnam, right? And of the South Vietnamese democratic project um, within Vietnam. Um, and it leads to a mass refugee exodus. So the US evacuates 125,000 refugees from Vietnam. Um, many are processed on the US territory of Guam. They also go through the Philippines, Clark Air Force Base, as I mentioned. Um, and this is again, sort of the connection or the resonance with what's happening today in Afghanistan. There's a lot of calls now on President Biden and the Biden administration to similarly open up um, the United States for the resettlement of the uh, Afghani allies who fought on behalf and worked with the United States within Afghanistan. And as many of us know, hundreds of thousands of more Vietnamese would then flee Vietnam by boat um, in the uh, later decades, right? So in the 1980s, um, and this again is how the larger Southeast Asian context comes into focus because a lot of the first asylum camps um, were across Southeast Asia. So places like Thailand, Malaysia, um, the Philippines, Singapore, Hong Kong, et cetera. Um, so a lot of Vietnamese refugees went there first before looking for permanent resettlement elsewhere in places such as the United States. So again, this really much informs my family history. Um, and you can, again, give me a shout out if uh, some of this is resonating with your family histories as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about how this family history um, has influenced some of my projects, some of my research projects, um, but also some of the work that I do. Um, so this is uh, my Vimeo page. I can drop the link in the chat when I'm done talking. Um, but these are some of the films that I made that were very much informed by thinking more about this family history and really unpacking it. Um, so this first uh, film that you see here is called Sang Ang Espiritu en Miga Vietnamese. Um, which translates um, from Tagalog, where's the spirit of the Vietnamese. So I'm really playing with this word, Espiritu, which again, as I mentioned, is um, my maiden last name um, from my dad's side, from the Filipino side, um, and thinking about informing my sort of Vietnamese Filipina subjectivity is one of the things that is underlying this film. Um, but it's also about the Vietnamese refugee camps uh, in the Philippines, such as at Bataan. Um, and sort of tracing that history of Vietnamese uh, Filipino convergence, right, of our histories um, and what role the Philippines played um, in that humanitarian refugee resettlement project. Um, this is another film that I made, it's called Who Was Colonel Hong Myung Gun? Um, and it's really interested in looking at the history as well as the different political memory projects around my grand uncle, um, who fought for the South Vietnamese army. Um, so this is my grandmother's, my maternal grandmother's older brother. Um, and he was actually publicly executed at the end of the Vietnam War for refusing to surrender um, to the North Vietnamese after the fall of Saigon. Um, and so I'm really interested in thinking about how his memory becomes very politicized then, right? So in sort of the Vietnamese communist unified state, he's seen as a political traitor. Um, but of course, his family members, his siblings who still live in Saigon, remember him as a brother, as an older figure, as a leader figure. Um, and then, of course, in the South Vietnamese diaspora, we have a lot of people who will look up to him as a political martyr, right? As someone who died for this democratic project um, that he believed in. So I really was really interested in unpacking all these different ways that he is talked about, um, but also really privileging um, my family history and how his relatives um, sort of think about him in relation to all these different uh, political aspects. Um, and the last one that I will emphasize here is called My Buy or Airplane. Um, and this was one of my first projects that I did, um, which really looks at my grandmother's um, history. So I grew up with my grandmother, um, my mom's mom in the household, um, but it wasn't until I went to college when I went to undergrad that I realized that I actually didn't know, you know much about her history. 
like, of course, I interacted with her every day. And, you know, she would make me breakfast and drive me to school, elementary school and all these things. But I realized I really didn't know about her life in Vietnam before she came to the United States, before she became a refugee um, and how she ended up here. And so part of that project was also to take photographs um, that of her life um, in Vietnam and to go back to Vietnam and then also sort of juxtapose them. Um, what the places and what they look like today. So here's a picture um, from several years ago of me and my grandmother. Um, and here's an example of one of the uh, photographs of her earlier life in Vietnam um, that she had. Um, I also want to highlight more recently this podcast episode that I did. Um, so if you want to learn a little bit more about my contemporary research project and Vietnamese refugees in Guam, um, this podcast Operation New Life really looks at the immediate aftermath of the fall of Saigon in April 1975. So from April to about, let's say, September 1975, Guam processed over 112,000 Vietnamese refugees, right? So Guam, as some of you might know, is a U.S. territory in the Pacific, also has a long history of Spanish colonialism um, and then U.S. intervention. And Guam's status is very similar to Puerto Rico. So the people of Guam, you know, since 1950 are US citizens. They're still denied key constitutional rights, such as the right to vote for a US president or the right to have a voting member in Congress, right? So I'm really interested in how this space that is still a territory or someone argue it's still a colony of the United States, then becomes a sort of stepping stone for Vietnamese refugee um, resettlement and Vietnamese refugee settlement or uh, citizenship. Um, so I'm really interested in thinking about how Vietnamese refugee resettlement um, then related to um, this ongoing Chamorro rights movement and a Chamorro decolonization movement that was really taking off in this 1970s moment um, and is quite strong today. Okay, so let's talk now a little bit more about Laos. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we have sort of Vietnamese or Vietnam's, Laos's, and Cambodia's histories being intertwined uh, since the French colonial period. So we really got to think about um, war in Laos as being connected to what I was just talking about, war in Vietnam. So the Laotian Civil War, um, 1959 to 1975, was between the communist Baptist Lao and the royal Lao government. Um, and again, like in Vietnam, it really became a proxy war between the Cold War superpowers when thinking about the Soviet Union and China supporting the communist Patet Lao and the U.S. supporting the royal Lao government. Um, overlapping this, we also have the U.S., what's called the U.S. Secret, law, secret War in Laos. So why was it secret? Um, so basically, the U.S. officially signed a Geneva Agreement of Neutrality in 1962, um, and after that, the CIA deliberately kept knowledge of military action in Laos from the American people, as well as from the international sphere, because it was technically illegal, right? So U.S. intervention in Laos, of course, broke the neutrality agreement. Um, so that was part of the secrecy um, behind this. And as a result, the CIA recruited uh, Hmong people from Laos to fight on their behalf. Um, so here we have Hmong General Vang Pao, who you might have heard of, who was a key figure in this military initiative. Um, and this also leads to the, after the war's end, the mass displacement of Hmong refugees, which I'll talk a little bit more about. All right, so thinking a little bit more about war in Laos. So from 1964 to 1973, the U.S. dropped more than 2 million tons of ordnance on Laos, uh, during 580,000 bombing missions. So it, the Cambodia remains, or sorry, Laos remains um, one of the most heavily bombed uh, countries. Um, and why did this happen? So again, it's related to uh, America's war in Vietnam. So Laos was the site of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, which you can see here which um, connected a North Vietnamese um, fighters. Um, they were bringing resources and military and food resources into the uh, struggle in South Vietnam. Um, and so because the trail weaved through the neighboring country of Laos, that was the key target of this US uh, bombing initiative. 
So Laos is the most heavily bombed country per capita in history, which again leads to refugee displacement, leads to the movement of our families um, to places like the United States. Um, and up to a third of the bombs dropped did not explode, which leads to a whole nother problem, right? So we have Laos actually contaminated with vast quantities of unexploded ordnance, um, also known as UXOs. So for example, this plane of jars, um, which is a world uh, UNESCO heritage site um, because of these interesting jar formations is also a key um, site of a lot of these unexploded ordinances. So I wanna talk a little bit then about um, Lao refugees, again, thinking about these migration histories. So in 1975, um, the communist Patet Lao took over Laos. Um, many Lao refugees crossed the Mekong River to seek refuge in refugee camps in Thailand. Um, so a lot of the oral histories and a lot of the literary productions, cultural productions about Lao refugee migration stories will really talk about crossing the river. Um, and refugees began arriving um, from Laos to the United States during the 1970s and more so during the 1980s. Um, and they resettled in places such as California, Texas, um, Minnesota, and other places. Um, so again, back to Sunni Lee, you know, there's a big Mon community uh, in Minnesota um, and in the Midwest more broadly. Um, but we can also think about a lot of Hmong farmers um, who are in the Central Valley. So again, give us a shout out um, if any of this resonates with your family history. Um, and as I mentioned, many of these refugees from Laos um, are also part of this ethnic minority or this indigenous group, the Hmong, which were um, seen as in a lot of ways outside um, of the Lao uh, nation. Um, so again, I just want to then talk about Cambodia, right? Again, thinking about how Cambodia is interrelated to this history of French colonialism, but also Cold War struggle. Um, and this is a really interesting film by Rithi Pond, which talks about um, the Khmer Rouge um, and the Cambodian genocide um, and how that influences cultural production. So I definitely encourage you um, to check it out. So the Cambodian Civil War, again, similar time period, 1968 to 1975. Um, and again, it was part of this sort of post-French colonial struggle of nation building. Um, again, we have to think about the Cold War context, thinking about this space that's adjacent to the Vietnam War, but also temporally at the same time. So the communist Khmer Rouge, supported by North Vietnam and the Viet Cong, versus the Kingdom of Cambodia, and then later the Khmer Republic, which was backed by the US and South Vietnam. So the, we have the Khmer Rouge victory, um, the establishment of democratic Kampuchea on April 17th, 1975. So again, just a couple of weeks before the fall of Saigon in April 30th, 1975, um, which unfortunately leads to a mass uh, Cambodian genocide. So Pol Pot aspired to turn Cambodia into a self-sufficient agrarian socialist society. Um, so for example, people like students and teachers and musicians um, and business owners were very much targeted um, during this, uh, this movement. And overall 1.5 to 2 million Cambodians died between 1975 and 1979. So that's a staggering amount of people and it's nearly a quarter of Cambodia's population. So thinking about how that affected the population but also how it affects the people who survived, right? And, and the people who had to leave Cambodia to flee this violence. So we have a mass outflow of refugees, again, to Thailand, places like Vietnam, as well as the United States. Um, so thinking about how these very tragic histories, again, inform our migration histories, but also how they cultivate um, a long history of resistance um, and survival, and how we can actually take strength um, from these histories and from our parents' and grandparents' um, stories of survival and resilience. Okay, so I want to um, switch gears a little bit now and share a um, podcast. Um, so one of the classes that I teach here at UCLA, it's called Critical Refugee Studies. So again, it's very much informed um, by, for example, these Southeast Asian refugee histories that I've been talking about. 
Um, but part of the idea of the class is to think about the refugee person and the refugee figure as not just a victim that is um, needs to be saved by humanitarian action, um, but also thinking about what is the agency, what is the strength of the refugee figure in and of themselves, right? And how can we actually center refugee voices and refugee stories um, in our research and in the way that we talk about refugees? Um, and as part of this class, I have a group podcast project. Um, so students work in groups to talk about a refugee issue of their choice from this critical refugee framework that we really try to think about during the quarter. So I wanna share this first episode from our latest season, season two, um, which talks about, uh, it's called The Things Inherited, and it's gonna talk a little bit about intergenerational trauma. Um, so I know we talk, we're gonna talk about mental health in a later session of this um, day long uh, presentation, but here I just wanna think a little bit more about how, as I was saying, these histories are not just relegated to the past, but they continue to influence us, influence our journeys and influence our stories. Um, and maybe intergenerational trauma is one analytic or one framework that we can help us to unpack this. So I'm gonna stop this PowerPoint sh uh, screen share and we are going to listen to this together. Welcome to the first episode of season two of Distorted Footprints, a critical refugee studies podcast. This podcast series is created at UCLA, and we acknowledge that this university is a land grant institution that occupies the homeland of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. This opening episode is called The Things Inherited, hosted by Yuki Tori, Gina Hin, and Alicia Fang. We will discuss intergenerational trauma and its effect on how second and third generation refugees interact with institutions in their daily lives and their process of healing. Songo and Cindy C. et al. in their 2017 research piece, Effects of Maternal Traumatic Distress on Family Functioning and Child Mental Health, an examination of Southeast Asian refugee families in the U.S., posits that intergenerational trauma is, quote, the ways in which trauma experienced in one generation influences the development and well-being of offspring in the subsequent generations, end quote. On a more personal level, UCLA alumni and second-generation Vietnamese-American Jacqueline Nguyen defines intergenerational trauma as, for me, my roots are my, the Asian-American community, the Vietnamese-American community. So intergenerational trauma, yeah, I think it really depends on like how you identify what your roots are and like who you identify with because like if something happens to like like whoever your roots are or whatever your roots are then it affects you like emotionally like if even if it doesn't affect you directly Jacqueline's parents came to the United States from Vietnam in the early to mid 1980s and her grandparents followed soon after in the early 90s during her time at UCLA, she was very involved in AAPI student organizations on campus, such as the Vietnamese Student Union and Nikkei Student Union, where she was able to explore her culture and learn more about her community. She's also very passionate about mental health as she studied psychology at UCLA. On another hand, Okay, so I'm going to pause there, um, but I will post a link to the episode if you like to uh, listen to the whole thing, and I definitely encourage you to check out um, the other episodes as well. Um, and, you know, I was very proud of the students, you know, again, as I mentioned, this was a student produced um, student research um, initiative. Um, and I think the podcast format is really great in being a very accessible format, right? Um, so one of the things that we really try to do is to translate things that we're listening, we're learning about in the UCLA classroom to the broader community, right? Um, because of course these things affect um, people and folks outside of the very sort of narrow uh, institutional space of a university classroom. Okay, so I'm gonna toggle back. I just have a couple more slides on my PowerPoint. Okay, so, um, so here are some sort of key takeaway points, right, of this presentation, right? Why are we talking about the historical context? So I wanna think about how you need to know history, right, to know self. Um, and I wanna sort of lead us, leave us with this quote by Jose Rizal, who's a Filipino nationalist. Um, he lived from 1861 to 1896. 
And he said, those who fail to look back to where they came from will not reach where they're going. So again, really thinking about how learning about our historical migration stories about these longer histories of colonialism and imperialism, it's really important to know them to really chart, you know, how did it get us here to this present moment and how is it also going to shape our future um, and where we go from here. So knowing where you came from can really guide where you're going. I think it's definitely informed my career path and my trajectory. Um, and I hope that you know this presentation has sort of shown you about how we can think about these historical resources um, to really inform how we forge our path ahead. So the future is yours for the taking. Um, and I'm really excited to see what you uh, plan to do um, with your um, upcoming year, um, as well as your educational journey. Um, so I do want to leave some time for q and A. I I know we have about 15 minutes left, um, but maybe if you can start posting your questions in the chat, I'll also open it up if you want to, um, to, to uh, use your mic. Um, but while you're sort of thinking about that, I just want to end with this plug for a little bit more about Asian American studies. So as uh, Jade mentioned, I am in the Department of Asian American Studies here at UCLA. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what is this field um, and its history and what you can learn from it. So if you do come to UCLA, you know, please take a class with me. I'd love to meet with you. Um, but I also know that there's a great initiative to have more ethnic studies and more Asian American studies across the community colleges as well. Um, so I worked with one of my great uh, master students from the UCLA program here, um, did her thesis on thinking about Asian American studies in the community college context. Um, and thinking about the growth of that and why it's really important to teach ethnic studies, right? Again, not only just within the sort of ivory tower of the UCs that doesn't reach as many people, but to think more widely about how the community college context can help us think about um, reaching a larger audience, but also thinking about the interplay of community formations. Okay. So this is a really um, important image from the really the beginning of the Asian American movement, which happened um, during the sort of 1960s, 1970s moment. And it says yellow peril supports black power. Um, so yellow peril was very much a negative stereotype that was thrown at Asians in the United States um, as a form of Asian exclusion. Um, but there was really a reclamation of that term and a way to thinking about interracial um, and cross-racial and transnational solidarities, right? So thinking this was at the same time as the civil rights movement, as the Black Power movement, and how can our communities of color really join together for strength? So Asian American studies as a sort of educational field, um, something that you can major in or minor in. So I definitely encourage you to think about it and check it out. Um, it's really born out of struggle. Um, so to think about some dates here, because again, as I mentioned, I'm a historian. So 1968, uh, the Third World Liberation Front Strike for Ethnic Studies um, started here in California. So at San Francisco State University um, and at UC Berkeley. And this again was a sort of cross-racial, um, larger people of color struggle um, of which Asian American studies was just one key part. Um, this influences the establishment of Asian American studies down here in Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, so in 1969, we have the UCLA Asian American Studies Center. Um, and this then leads to the establishment of a formal academic department um, in 2004. So the Department of Asian American Studies, um, which is quite strong, is one of the largest in the nation um, and probably, I guess, in the world. So we have uh, 20 core faculty um, and we are growing. I think that we um, plan to hire uh, again next year uh, in the future years. Um, another key point about Asian American studies I want to emphasize is that it's transnational, right? So a lot of the histories that I talked about in this presentation, they don't just focus on the US, but they focus on Southeast Asia as a space. Um, and that's something that really informs our analytic, because again, materially, it informs how our histories are produced. Um, so thinking about Asian and Pacific Islander refugee and immigrant communities that are located here in the United States, um, but also thinking about this larger history of U.S. empire in Asia and the Pacific, right? How it informs our migration histories and community formations. Um, and Asian American studies is also comparative and relational. So by that, I mean that we're really interested in building connections with Black, Indigenous, Latinx communities um, 
and thinking about how can we uh, form solidarities, right? Um, even as we acknowledge um, inter-ethnic and cross-racial uh, tensions, the ways our communities are sometimes pitted against each other, right? Um, in really harmful ways. Asian American studies is also really interdisciplinary. So depending on your different uh, disciplinary interests, you know, I guarantee there's something for you. So we have a combination of history, sociology, communications, political science, public health, psychology, um, literature, film, new media, um, just to name some of the um, different disciplines that inform the professor's research, but also inform the different ways um, and methodologies that we teach in our classrooms. And lastly, I just wanna say that Asian American Studies is really committed to social justice. Um, I think that's something that also informs the CCCP uh, project um, and really is something that I think can ground our education um, and make it more meaningful in a lot of ways. So I'll go ahead um, and stop there and I'd love to hear from you. So uh, I know we have a couple minutes left. So if folks have questions or if you wanna um, sort of let us know um, what part of this, um, this presentation might've resonated with you, I'd love to hear from you. Oh, my bad. My bad. My bad. this. Hi. Um, I had a quick, not a very quick question, but I had an idea as a minority student um, growing up in Long Beach, California. I had the pleasure of working with John Muir Academy and we had free after school programs. And um, I noticed that a lot of the peers outside of the school I went to didn't get to experience um, the luxury of arts education as well as sports education. So I had a question for any professionals if they had any suggestions on grant writing for foundations. I am a Cypress College Community College student, pre-medicine. I intend to um, study sports medicine or OBGYN. So if anybody can give me a suggestion, I will go ahead and put my information in the chat if they know where I can get started on this foundation. Awesome, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I definitely agree that you know the arts and culture and cultural representations is a key um, point. So yeah, I know you um, direct messaged me, but if you can go ahead and maybe uh, rewrite that, um, I'm sure folks will love to, to help you get started um, on this. Um, grant writing is definitely a really important um, part of these initiatives, how to get funding to serve them. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Any other questions out there? Um, I had a question uh, in the chat whether Asian American Studies also um, covers international relations. Um, yes, the question, the answer is yes. Um, so here at UCLA, we have a global studies major, um, which in a lot of ways uh, interacts with international relations as a field. Um, so that critical refugee studies class that I mentioned uh, is actually cross-listed um, with global studies. Um, so again, really thinking about the interplay between the domestic and the international uh, focus. It's not a question, but it's a comment. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It is um, you know, you talk about you. Uh, the, the quote about you don't know who you are unless you know where you came from is so powerful and something that we talk about a lot, knowing your history, but not only knowing it, but teaching it, because we need to make sure that it's taught from our perspectives. So I truly appreciate your presentation and things that we never learn about other communities. I mean, I've learned a lot today, just in the short amount of time 
because this is stuff we don't hear about unless you take a specific kind of a course. But I so appreciate the opportunity to at least touch upon some of those things. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'll post a couple links in the chat. I'll also post my email. Um, so feel free to stay in touch. Any, uh, if you don't mind, we, we can post them in, in the website that we're sharing with the students, those links, if, you, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds great too. So I can post them in the chat and someone can um, take them and put them on the website. Any final questions for our speaker at this point? Um, there's a question that comes in. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about how learning about your own history and context and taking an Asian American studies course can help um, with other majors and careers. Um, that's a great question. Um, so I think maybe to start answering this question, I wanna highlight um, our commencement speaker uh, for our past um, Asian American studies uh, graduation um, this past June. So her name is uh, Sarah Wing. Um, and she now is actually a small business owner. She's an entrepreneur. Um, and she, um, talk, she, she basically starts this company, Wing Coffee Supply, um, which imports um, coffee from Vietnam um, to the US uh, context. Um, and it's one of the first companies to sort of start that production chain. Um, and in her uh, interviews about starting her company and what inspired her, she talks about um, taking Asian American studies at UCLA. Right. Um, and maybe that seems counterintuitive, like what can Asian American studies teach me about being business, you know, a business owner. Um, but she really talks about, you know, how she learned from the strengths of her family history. Um, and that really informed why she wanted to start this company um, that also, in, you know, leads to how her family history really inspired her. Um, and so, again, I think, you know, Asian American studies is a very sort of interdisciplinary um, major. Um, another key initiative that I want to um, highlight is, you know, one of the things I really love about our students as well is that the students, you know, really have a lot of initiative, right? Um, so when I first came to UCLA my first year, a couple students approached me and they said, we're really interested in starting um, a translation uh, project um, to kind of as a supplement of the um, wonderful um, Southeast Asian language classes that are taught here at UCLA. You know, how can we have sort of student peer teachers? Um, and this sort of morphed into a, a student initiated and student led Vietnamese medical terminology class. Um, so again, we have a lot of STEM majors, um, a lot of folks who are interested in going into the medical profession. And they really wanna know, well, how can we serve and better serve our communities that we come from specifically? And one way to do that is really to focus on language and language access, right? Um, and so I was really excited to see these students come together and put together a syllabus of key medical terms and how can we translate them into Vietnamese um, and really use that to teach other students um, who are interested in similar um, initiatives. Um, so again, that was something that the department didn't initially offer, but these students came to me and they said, you know, this is something that we're really invested in. We think that it's related to the Asian American Studies Initiative. Um, can you help us support um, this initiative? Um, so I'm really excited, um, again, of how I think Asian American Studies can affect, you know, all these different career paths um, and fields that people are interested in. Well, thank you so very much for this. And let's uh, everyone give her a Zoom applause for joining us. And uh, we definitely in CCP appreciate your contribution and know that we will reach out to you for further uh, involvement in the work that we're doing as we launch our Southeast Asian initiatives. So um, we appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to see this initiative in play. We can share the screen.
Oops. Just a minor technical difficulty. And I think we're moving on. And hi, everybody. I'm Melissa Velus Abraham. Um, I introduced myself earlier before, but here I am again. And I'm um, here to introduce our next panelists and speakers. Um, I work at the UCLA Student Organizations Leadership and Engagement Office. So what I do is work with many student organizations, um, um, you know, and, and various student leaders to, you know a lot of the work that they do outside of the classroom, you know, through um, community work, um, different uh, programs, community service projects. So it, it very robust student activities here at UCLA initiated by students and hopefully, you know, wherever you go, um, even in your own community colleges, you're engaged in that because a lot of learning happens there as well. So, um, Moving on to our next speakers, um, let me introduce um, our first one, Dr. La Chica Buena Vista. And, um, and we also have Annie Pham, who is a student, and they will be talking about the model minority, minority myth and student advocacy. And um, Dr. Let's see, sorry. Dr. Um, Tracy Buena Vista La Chica is a professor of Asian American Studies and a core faculty member in the doctoral program in education leadership. She also serves as co-principal investigator for the CSUN Dream Center, Asian American Studies Pathways Project and Ethnic Studies Education Pathways Project. She is also a member of the Project Rebound Community Advisory Committee, Professor Buena Vista teaches courses on race and racism, immigration and research methods, and her, in her research uses critical race theory to examine how education, immigration, carcerality shape the contemporary experiences of Filipino, Filipina, Filipinex, Asian American, and other people of color in the U.S. So let's welcome Dr. Tracy Buena Vista La Chica. We also have Ms. Annie Pham. Um, pronouns she, her, hers, and she is a rising fourth year psychology major with an education studies and Asian languages minor. Um, Annie is the retention coordinator for the Vietnamese Student Union, and she oversees the project space CClear, which is a student initiated retention project at UCLA. In the future, Annie plans to work in counseling, either in an educational or clinical space. So let's give our speakers a warm welcome. Hi everyone, I think I'm going first, right? Yes. Okay, so let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. Okay, can y'all see that? Yes. Okay, awesome. So, uh, you know, I, I will say that um, I know that you'll be chatting. I know the chat is always active. Um, so I will try to pay attention to it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll try to pay attention to it. But if I am missing something, just go ahead and uh, yell at me and tell me that I'm missing something. Okay. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Tracy Lachica Buena Vista. My pronouns are she, her, Isuna. Um, before I begin, I want to acknowledge that I'm an uninvited Filipino settler living and working on the lands of the Tongva and Tataviam communities. Um, and as a Pinay, uh, my community is well aware of the violence of colonialism and displacement. And that is actually, I think, what brings Southeast Asian American communities together. Like we have that shared um, history, um, as uh, Dr. Espiritu Gandhi just, um, you know, um, shared with you, right? Um, and this. 
uh, history has really shaped my work. It's really shaped my trajectory into higher ed. Um, I'm really glad to be presenting with Annie. Um, I started out in um, college working with student initiated retention projects as a student activist. Um, you know, I was retained through ethnic studies. I don't think if I had ethnic studies, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I'm going to talk a lot about those things, um, but also just story tell with you all, sort of tell what is my experience, um, why I focus on um, students of color, but particularly Asian Americans in education, um, specifically undocumented students, and how ethnic studies has really served as an antidote to a lot of the issues that um, my community experiences. Um, and so again, today, I just really want to use my experiences being first gen um, Filipino college student turned faculty uh, to introduce you to this concept, right? I, that's one thing I've been tasked to do, introduce you to and then challenge this idea that we call the model minority myth um, in higher education, right? Um, it, just by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the model minority myth? You all can just, you know, put in, okay. Some people are using a handful of people, and that's good. So we're just going to review for those folks and introduce, um, you know, the idea for other folks. Um, and, and so I wanted to begin by actually doing a short exercise, one minute exercise um, that I do with my students in my intro to Asian American studies classes, right? Because we're also trying to give you a sense of, um, you know, what will it be like when you transfer, right? Um, so if you all can just entertain me, put your thinking caps on, uh, and go ahead and take one minute and list every single Asian or Pacific Islander ethnic community that you could think of, right? It could be the ethnic community you identify with. It could be, you know, your, um, your homies identity, et cetera. But if you can go ahead and just list in the chat, right? Um, which ethnic groups make up the Asian American and Pacific Islander community? I see one so far. I have Indian, I got Cambodian. Vietnamese, Filipino, Filipino, Indonesian. Of course, we got all these Southeast Asians in the house. Chinese, Thai, Lao, Hmong, Korean, Malaysian. Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> Did she drop out? I think she may have dropped. Yeah, so it looks like she dropped. She should probably join us in a minute, but keep posting. Oh, there we go. She just got too excited with all, all these there, communities that were being named. She's back. <laughs> I'm back. I'm I'm back. I, I lost you all for a second. I, I think that was my internet. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. And there's a okay. long, long list in the chat. <laughs> okay. Okay. There's, sorry about that, y'all. I'm glad we did the exercise. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what's happening? Where'd they go? Okay, so, you know, you know, you all came up with a pretty comprehensive list, a lot of, you know, a lot of groups, Southeast uh, Asian groups, you know, at the end, I see Pacific Islander communities, right, being um, acknowledged, right. But again, um, when people think about the API community, many of the ethnic groups that you listed are not necessarily the ethnic groups that um, are sort of thought about in, pu in public discourse, right? Um, and, and so one, first, one of the things I wanted to acknowledge, right, is that um, even though we think of ourselves as the API community, right, this is a really contested term, 
right? Um, it was in the 80s that the government actually lumped all these communities together into one racial category, but in reality, um, they're super diverse. Um, and so I like to show this list. This is a list I have my students study, and I don't know if you all have ever seen a list like this, but these are all the different ethnic groups that actually constitute the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, right? Um, and even though, it, you know, on the streets, right, in public talk, we always say API or a, um, Asian American Pacific Islander, Asian Pacific Islander, Daisy American, um, really, the government now recognizes these groups as two distinct groups. We're formally separated, right? But in practice, right, again, like on the streets, these this lumping of these groups really have stuck, right? Um, and, and central to the, the debate over, you know, whether or not we should sort of separate or um, talk about these groups is really distinct is the reality that, you know, this API category is made up of more than 50 different ethnic groups. And there's more, but these are just the ones that are technically recognized according to the census, right? Um, and the issue is, is that the groups with larger representation tend to have the dominant voice in determining what the public's understanding is of who we are, right? And so again, I like to show this list because once you see this list, it becomes a little bit easier for people to understand how there's no way that every single member of these different groups can have the same history, the same migration story, the same language, religion, culture, and even within ethnic groups, family traditions can really differ, right? Um, and that difference, I, I talk about this difference because uh, that difference is why we're here today. The needs and the issues of brown Asian Americans are often overlooked, right? I consider myself a brown Asian American um, because there are massive healthcare, education, um, economic disparities among these groups, especially among Southeast Asian groups. Um, I became a professor because um, I come from an immigrant, um, poor family. Um, and when I was going through higher ed, I really saw how educators really dismissed the issues of my community because they didn't think that students who looked like me um, had any hardships or experienced any barriers, right? There was just a lot of misconceptions of who we are as a community, what are our needs and how best to serve them, right? And among the biggest barrier for us is this assumption that all Asian Americans are the same and we are all um, what we call model minorities. And, and so for those of you who have never heard sort of a technical definition, right? Um, but might sort of see it in practice, right? Um, the model minority stereotype, it's a stereotype that assumes that Asians or Asian Americans, we're all quiet, we're all obedient. Um, you know, we, we listen to our elders and uh, we study super hard. And this is why we have a universal academic and economic success, right? Um, and so there's a, a big assumption that Asian American students don't struggle in school. Um, but again, if you look at the research or if you speak to different community members, we know that this is not true. Um, but what you also have to know, um, and um, you know, I believe uh, Dr. Espiritu Gandhi um, talked about this too, is that our histories are very much tied to the histories of other people of color in the United States. And a lot of folks that don't know that this particular stereotype has played a big political function during the civil rights era. Um, the model minority myth, right, was a classic example of political divide and conquer, and it was popularized in the 1960s by conservatives to serve as a challenge to the black led civil rights movement. Right. So the civil rights movement was saying that, you know, there's racism in this country. And because there's racism in this country, we really have to change the institutions. We have to change the laws in order for equality to be achieved. And so what conservatives did was they highlighted the experiences of Asian Americans and they said, well, look at these people of color. They're doing fine. When in reality, we had benefited from various social programs um, and you know, different mi migration histories that, you know, position some Asian American communities to be um, a little bit more financially secure, but not the majority. Now, also keep in mind, like the civil rights movement occurred after World War II and the Korean War, where Asian Americans were considered like literally the enemy. 
um, right? There's Japanese internment and these like histories are often forgotten. Um, and Asian Americans had suffered so much discrimination up until that point that when people started to, you know, characterize them as model minorities, um, it was one of the first times they were seen as quote unquote, like desirable in the United States. And so one way that they responded was that many Asian Americans started to really embrace this stereotype. Um, it was a way to actually avoid more explicit forms of discrimination. And this strategy of avoiding, you know, um, other forms of discrimination through assimilation still continues today. And that's why you see a lot of Asian American parents, um, some of your peers, et cetera, actually promoting that idea. Right. Um, but again, like all stereotypes, there's really big consequences to all of this. Right. And some of those consequences is that, you know, those those more than 50 ethnic groups that I showed you, a lot of their stories are ignored. A lot of their issues um, um, are not being raised. A lot of their needs are not being met because the model minority really hides the diversity of APIDA experiences and it projects really white created characteristics and standards onto our community, right? Um, so this is sort of like a larger context, you know, this is like gonna end like the lecture portion uh, of, of, of my presentation, but you know, my whole, if you leave with anything from this presentation is this idea of the model minority myth or this idea that Asian Americans are exceptional is just a myth, right? It's, it's false um, and we really need to break that because it's an anti-Black uh, stereotype, right? Now, I wanted to share all of this with you because throughout my journey in higher ed, um, I found myself battling this stereotype on an everyday basis, right? You know, from subtle things, from teachers assuming how to be good at math, right, to, you know, cl other classmates um, assuming that I wasn't experiencing any, like, barriers. Um, and some of the biggest barriers that I faced going through higher ed was really racist classism or this discrimination against um, people who are not from affluent or even middle-class backgrounds, right? Um, and this intersected with my experience of being also uh, Filipino or Asian American. Um, so the, the model minority myth really led all the educators around me to dismiss the financial barriers I experienced during my time in higher ed. So I should say I never had an Asian American instructor until college and until I specifically rolled in Asian American studies. But prior to then, I was a science major. I majored in biology. And so I experienced a lot of this racist classism in those in that sort of STEM setting. Right. So as an undergrad, I, you know, I I really suffered from a lot of financial issues. Um, so for example, you all have virtual access to books. Back in the day, we didn't. So what I'd have to do is I'd contact faculty in advance to inquire about required texts. Um, then when I would know what the texts were, I'd go to the library, see if I could borrow them before I would actually have to spend money, right, on things I'd only use once, right? Um, some things that I used to do with classmates is we'd pull our money together to buy one book, to, and then we'd make photocopies, and then we'd return the book, <laughs> right? Um, and even today, I still download books from all these questionable websites, and I try to distribute them to all my students, so if you ever take a class with me, you never have to buy any text, right? Um, but also what happened in higher ed is as you sort of progress through higher ed, there's all these ways that you sort of have to perform that you've attained your degree. Um, I have this picture. This is from our graduation last year over Zoom, right? And one of the things you see on graduation day is all the different faculty wearing their graduation regalia. They're like these fancy Harry Potter outfits, right? Um, and I remember even after I received my PhD, I could not afford to buy myself a gown. And the reason why I say I could not afford to buy myself a gown is those gowns basically were the exact same amount as my rent, right? So I had to choose between paying rent and supporting my family or buying this regalia, this gown that I would only wear maybe once a year, right? And so I wanted to talk about these moments as a faculty member because people think that once you go through higher ed, you've made it. And I just want you to know that sometimes the things that we bring with us to higher ed never leave us, but they greatly shape the way that we can participate in it, right? Um, so for like many of you and like many of us, we're minoritized. So 
we could gain access to the academy, but it doesn't mean that we're always able to fully participate in it, right? And that's why these spaces like CCCP are so important. Um, now, racist classism also played out um, in the ways that um, our communities are talked about in higher ed. So one of the other things I always experience, and I still experience in working with my own students, I work at California State University in Northridge, which is a, a working class um, public institution. And I always hear um, you know, people talking about how uh, when you come from poor backgrounds or working class backgrounds, you're financially illiterate, right? Um, but, you know, I always challenge people to rethink what they, how they're characterizing us, because I don't think we're illiterate, we just have a different relationship to money, because we don't possess a lot of it, right? Um, but everything in higher ed is really designed to assume that you have this financial literacy, um, and, you know, and that's not true. Right. Um, I was, you know, as a first gen college student, I was required to develop a financial literacy, um, learn about my money options that my immigrant parents didn't have access to. Um, and I'm just going to make the assumption that some of you might be experiencing that, too. Um, so, for example, when you go to college, there's, you know, sometimes you'll be eligible for grants, sometimes you'll be eligible for loans. Um, you know, I took out loans um, because I didn't want my family to have to be burdened with helping me through college and they literally just couldn't, right? Um, but one of the things I did was I maximized what we call subsidized or low interest loans to offset costs that my family would typically incur on like a credit card, right? So if my family had bills to pay, typically they'd use a credit card because we didn't have enough in the bank to actually pay that bill. So instead of them using that credit card, I took out a loan for school. I didn't use it for school, <laughs> right? Um, but I used it to help my family, right? Um, you know, one of the things you'll learn in higher ed is you're eligible for a one-time com emergency commu computer loan. And I don't know if any of you have ever used that computer loan, but in college, I remember I used this emergency computer loan, but it wasn't to buy a computer. It was to actually help my parents when they were about to lose their home. Um, and they needed money for, um, you know, basically to keep our home. And so I found out I could get this computer loan. I applied for it. I got the money. And, you know, there's a lot of shame that comes with, you know, having to do that. But, you know, for me, it was more important to save the home. So I didn't buy a computer with a computer loan, but I saved the home that the computer was located in, right? <laughs> and I thought that that was important. Um, so, you know, again, there's a lot of financial barriers that first gen students from immigrant families experience. Um, and in the beginning, I really was hard on myself for sort of amassing or collecting all of this debt that I now have to pay back. But in reality, you know, I learned that this is not just an issue for me. It's not an individual issue. We're literally going to college at a time where everyone is reliant on loans and student debt, et cetera. And right now we have uh, stu students have the worst student debt crisis in the history of the United States. It's $1.7 trillion and things are just gonna get worse. And, and I'm partially telling you all of this because these are things that people didn't talk to me about, the financial cost about college, right? Um, and so I think it's just really open to have, um, important to have these open conversations so that you know that there are people who understand that and can walk you through and guide you through some of these issues that you might experience or have prevent you from going to the school that you wanna go to. Um, right now I work with students who are food insecure, students who have experienced houselessness, have housing insecurity, and with COVID, you know, um, my students are among those 1 million households in California that are behind in rent, right? And I have deep empathy for these students because um, of my own experience as a working class student. Uh, and again, I mentioned earlier, I didn't have any faculty who looked like me, who could sort of guide, I trusted to guide me through these issues. When I try to talk to counselors and advisors about these things, they often were like, well, just work more or study more. And they really didn't understand like 
you know, sometimes their suggestions just were not realistic for the obligations I had to fulfill uh, as a daughter in my family. Um, so my parents, they immigrated in the like, late 1960s and early 70s, um, and they held multiple jobs, um, including facilities maintenance, fruit, food prep, like my mom was a cafeteria lady. Um, she worked in a factory, a book factory. Um, my dad was actually a facilities worker when I was attend um, at UC Berkeley when I was attending UC Berkeley, right? And so that, you know, that that tension of, you know, you being a student at an elite institution, but your, your parent being the staff there, right? Oh, um, so I'm getting emotional. I always get emotional when I talk about that. Um, but these were some of the issues that, you know, like my community was dealing with. And, um, you know, it was never talked about, even in Asian American studies, right? My parents regularly sent remittances, which is you make money here only to send it back, right? <laughs> um, and they did that because they were funding secure housing and medical care for their parents, their siblings. Um, they basically paid for um, the schooling for, you know, all their nieces and nephews and extended family members who remained in the Philippines. And my parents come from, both of them have um, eight other siblings. Right, so you can sort of imagine the the pressure, the financial pressure um, that my parents felt to provide for their families, not only in the United States but also abroad, right? Um, and so remittances is something that is super conditioned in me, right? I understand that when you have access to resources, when you are put in a position of privilege, it is your responsibility to redistribute that wealth. Right. Um, and, and that is how I have approached my time in higher ed and as a faculty member. And so I kind of want to talk about that. Um, you know, part of me sharing this story with all of you is to, you know, sort of show you that if you have similar experiences, you can progress through higher ed. Um, and if you do, there are so many opportunities for you to give back. And um, I like cannot wait for you to join me, right? So that we can do this together. Um, so my experience as like an underrepresented brown Asian American and first gen college student, you know, um, with deep, deep working class proletariat roots, it shapes everything that I do. Um, as a faculty member. Um, and one thing that I am is that I'm a hustler through and through, right? Um, I hustle for every grant, every award, knowing that if I'm successful, I'm gonna generate some resources that then could supplement the incomes of the people that are around me. So my faculty approach to most things um, is, again, what I say, or what I say, uh, call is financial redistribution, right? Um, I take opportunities to make opportunities for other. I think that's one of our responsibilities as underrepresented folks in higher ed. Um, there's money that's selectively accessible to people privileged to enter higher ed, and my pursuit um, of higher ed has been an attempt to actually get access to these resources. So again, I can redistribute that wealth um, to those of us who don't come from it, right? Um, but we can collectively persist in spaces that are not of us, right? Um, and, and so I, I, I wanna say that again, right? I think that it's our responsibility to redistribute wealth to those of us who do not come from wealth so that we can collectively persist in spaces that are not of us. Um, so like as an example, you know, in the past five years, um, I've gotten like a million dollars in grants and those grants have um, created 40 jobs for undergrads. Um, I've created three full time staff positions and I've gotten stipends for all of my colleagues. Right. Um, and at the same time, all of the work that I do in that regard is all uncompensated. I don't pay myself. Right. Um, usually I use my own money and I'll buy food for students. I'll provide funds for students in emergencies, gas, food, random thank yous. Um, more recently, you know, you're hearing of all these federal stimulus checks, right? Um, I actually use my federal stimulus checks to jumpstart a mutual aid fund. And we call, um, fund, I use that as a base and then we fundraised and we, uh, fundraised almost $30,000 and we redistributed that uh, guerrilla style 
to undocumented students and systems impacted students, those who are formerly incarcerated um, and alumni, right? Who experienced COVID related unemployment. Um, and my friend, he has financial like planning experience. And he told me, you know what? If you stopped with all these unnecessary spending, right? Um, you would be more financially secure in the future, right? He's trying to like warn me, right? Um, but I haven't stopped because I personally know the difference um, with, with that short-term financial relief can actually have on the wellness of a student, right? I had mentors who would, you know, buy me food. I had mentors who would help me pay for books. Um, and all of that helped to alleviate like the stress that I had to navigate as a first gen API student who didn't have a lot of um, like mentors to rely on, right? Um, and so these financial barriers um, I described, they're difficult to navigate, but um, what made it worse again was the the disregard that higher ed practitioners um, had um, because they would often interpret my financial issues as like a personal issue. Like, oh, you have money issues, not because you're a poor brown Asian, but because you don't know how to save your money, right? <laughs> and, you know, and that simply wasn't the case, right? They just didn't understand what Southeast Asian American immigrant students have to deal with when it comes to supporting families financially. Um, so throughout my undergrad, throughout grad school, I always worked 30 hours or more a week um, because for my family, I could only go to college if I was still financially assisting at home, right? So they would only allow me to go to college if I can show them that I could still contribute to the family. Um, and again, even so counselor, they, they'd always tell me, you know, if you work less, you can focus on your grades, um, you know, because they didn't believe that I had to do those things. They, they believed that I chose to do those things. And, and again, that wasn't the case. Um, and again, because of this model minority myth, um, this pan-ethnic sort of category, all these really nuanced issues that Southeast Asian Americans experience really go unnoticed, um, not even to the point where we are underserved. I would actually argue our community is just not served, right? Um, we're not served because a lot of people don't, ex don't believe that we experience racism. Right, um, and, and this is part of the reason I became faculty. I really wanted to document and reveal the different ways that we experience racism, the financial barriers that we experience and how that's tied to, you know, this deep xenophobia, right? This idea that no matter how long we've been here in the US, Asian Americans, but particularly brown Asian Americans will always be perceived as perpetual foreigners, right? And again, this anti-Asian racism, it comes in many forms from subtle microaggressions, right, to full on hate crimes. And while many of us know this and have experienced this, you know, people finally believe us because of, you know, all the public uh, display of, of violence against our community, right? So, you know, I, I just want to highlight, you know, um, this very real issue that is still continuing to impact our communities, but particularly Southeast Asian communities. Um, APETA issues have taken a national stage due to the violent assaults against their community, right? In 2021 alone, right? And 2021 is not even done, right? We've already experienced more than 4,500 hate incidents, which if you think about it, that's 25 per day or one every hour. Right. Um, and these incidents, um, you know, range from verbal assaults to, to deliberate avoidance, uh, physical assaults, et cetera. Um, but one of the things that is not talked about is how, you know, a lot of these incidents are taking place in the public and folks are not saying anything. They're not um, standing up for our community. Um, you know, um, one of the stats that I think really moves me um, as an educator and also as a parent is that. 10% or one in 10 of the incidents that are being reported right now um, to the Stop AAPI Hate um, campaign um, is against young people, basically those who are um, 17 and younger, right? Um, and 
that's that very real racial bullying that happens to a lot of um, APITA students, right? Um, and again, we know that none of this is new, um, but I wanted to be very explicit that this violence has always characterized um, Southeast Asian American experiences in the US. Um, now I know I've been kind of a bummer, right? So all the issues I highlight, um, I highlight them because those are my experiences. Um, I also highlight them because they're very, very real. But I also want to highlight that we as a community and other people of color, we're not defined by the harm or the damage that has been done to us, right? Often in, injustice is what has fueled all of our resistance. You know, Dr. Spiritu Gandhi talked about Asian American studies or ethnic studies, and I wanna, I wanna also talk about it and end here with this message, right? Um, that ethnic studies has been a proven antidote to a lot of the uh, financial and racial aggressions that I have been talking about. Um, again, um, as a first gen faculty being working class and um, being among a few Filipinos in higher ed, um, ethnic studies and Asian American studies really specifically, that was the space where I finally had a lens um, and a language to be able to read my world, right? To understand my world. It was in ethnic studies that I had my first Filipino teacher where I finally felt smart, where I developed an academic identity and a purpose. Um, and now as a professor in Asian American studies, um, it literally provides the roof over my head and puts food on the table and that of my family. And so I'm really committed to growing, sustaining ethnic studies education as an effective mechanism to challenge white supremacy. Um, and I'm asking all of you to join me, <laughs> right? Um, ethnic studies is effective precisely because it's not confined to a classroom. So even though I was introduced to ethnic studies in the classroom, the concepts and the principles are something that I use every day to raise my child eco. So this is eco. I want to introduce eco. Eco just started kindergarten yesterday. And I was so surprised to learn and to see that they're the only Asian presenting kid in the class. Now, I say Asian presenting because eco is multiracial, but I also don't know what the identities are of his classmates, right? Um, and if the research holds true, eco will inevitably be bullied because of his race, right? Um, but as a multiracial Mexipino kid, right? Eco possesses a critical racial literacy that they can draw on to understand what's happening to them and intervene when he sees injustice happening to either himself or his classmates, right? Um, Eco is five years old, but Eco already knows that Black Lives Matter. He knows that Brown is beautiful. He smashes the patriarchy with his Legos. <laughs> Right. Um, and he knows that solidarity is necessary. Right. Like these are all things that young people can really learn at a really early age. And I saw earlier in the chat how someone mentioned we need ethnic studies in preschool. And I completely agree. And I believe it's accessible. Right. Um, so, again, uh, for many of you, you might be the first person in your family to attend college. You might even be the first person um, from your community or among a small few to actually pursue higher ed. And so what I want to leave you with is that although our community is small, there are people who have similar experiences as you um, that are in the academy and are ready to receive you. I'm ready to receive you. If any of you are ever considering majoring in Asian American studies or, or really want um, to explore, you know, really critical education, come to CSUN. I know you're, you're interested in UCLA, but, you know, CSUN's a dope option. I would love to have you there, right? Um, the majority of Southeast Asian American faculty can actually be found in fields like ethnic studies, Asian American studies, Asian studies, and education. The majority of Filipino professors are in the Cal State University system, right? And I just think that is something I'm so proud of because our community is also there, right? Um, so I encourage you to look at us. I encourage you to support us by taking our classes. Um, and I encourage you to be in community with us um, because we're waiting, right? Like we're waiting for you to join us. Um, and so with that, I will pass it on to Amy. Thank you.
Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Tracy, for um, going through your conversation on the model minority myth and just how imperative it is that we um, start dismantling these barriers, especially because they affect so many of the students in higher education. So just to give another introduction again, uh, my name is Annie and my pronouns are she, hers. I'm a rising fourth year psychobiology major at UCLA and I'm a traditional student. So that means I started here as an incoming freshman. Uh, right now I have minors in education studies as well as Asian languages and I identify as Vietnamese American. I wanted to come here today to just give you a brief presentation on a space that I have been involved in for the last three years and have found such a large connection to, especially how um, this space has been working to address the model minority myth as well as provide college students at UCLA just more support and understanding about their culture, a space for them to share about their different experiences, as well as a space for um, Southeast Asian students to just learn about where their history is, what supports they have, and how they can achieve in higher education. So let me share my screen. So I'll give a brief overview about CCLEAR. Um, if any of you have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat function or just unmute yourself um, if I don't see it first. So starting off, CCLEAR stands for the Southeast Asian Campus Learning Education and Retention Project. And why is this called a project as well? instead of like an organization or a club? I will let you all know in a little bit. But this is a retention project that was established by in 1998 by the Vietnamese Student Union at UCLA, so also known as VSU. And so I've been saying this word a lot, retention, and retention in higher education. So what does this really mean and how does it apply to us, to you and to me? So retention, what I found on Google was the definition is the power or ability to keep or to hold something. So what does retention, what does that power, that ability to hold on look like in higher education? And especially what does it look like for Southeast Asian students like you and I? So retention in higher education is not only for students to achieve degree attainment, so that is whether it be their associates, their bachelors, masters, whatever it is they are trying to achieve on their academic journey but to help students also find success post-graduation. So being able to graduate with a confidence of looking for job opportunities, for pursuing even higher education after that, this is the type, these are the type of things that retention looks like in higher education. So students should be able to have the confidence and the knowledge as well as resources to navigate the higher education system without having any fears of the convoluted or complicated academic system with all of the rules, the policies, um, systems that aren't exactly built for students of color like us or lack of basic needs, whether that be housing insecurities or food insecurities or just facing minimal holistic support in education and career building, um, as well as just social support. And why is retention so important for Southeast Asian students? So the Southeast Asian subgroup is actually the fastest growing subgroup of Asian Americans in the United States. And despite this, degree attainment rates still remain below the US average. And this is in all, all forms of higher education, whether that be bachelor's, master's, um, and uh, even higher. And what are, why is this the case? Like we've been talking a lot about like the model minority myth and a lot of, um, a lot of the factors that are affecting the way that students are treated in school and the type of resources that students receive. So factors that are affecting the retention rates include like the access to culturally competent resources. And what are culturally competent resources? These are the type of resources that Southeast Asian students or students of color can identify with, can understand more. Universities or colleges, um, academic institutions tend to provide more general services for take for example in mental health. Um, a lot of, uh, it's, 
a lot of academic institutions offer some form of mental health a mental health um, help, whether it is like the university therapist. However, these are all therapists that aren't trained to fully assist um, students of color or specifically Southeast Asian students. Uh, I can speak for UCLA specifically. There's only one Asian American uh, CAPS counselor. So that's the counseling and psychological services counselor. And they are always in high demand by a lot of our students yet. Um, because they have been able to show that they're able to understand a lot of the things that the students go through and kind of relate to that cultural as well as like familial aspect a lot more. Aside from like having these culturally competent resources, other factors can be like the different stereotypes from the model minority myth that Dr. Tracy went over and the way that um, the model minority myth doesn't help us. And even though it does put um, Asian Americans in like a better light. It, this is almost like a backhanded um, statement because instead it reduces the amount of resources that uh, Southeast Asian or Asian American students can receive, especially if they're thought about as being more successful and, um, and uh, academically successful. And there are tons of unaddressed community conditions um, that different Southeast Asian students face. For example, like the socio-politically divided communities that they may live in and the intergenerational gaps between uh, first and second generation um, parents as well as like second or third generation students. And a lot of these communities um, have arrived to the United States post-1975 are still in the process of adapting to the new um, to the new country as well as rebuilding different communities and enclaves within America. So with all these um, with all these rebuilding and adap uh, adaptations that need to be done, a lot of these students are pulled out of um, entirely focusing on their academics, like how students uh, are expected to be. And they're working with their parents, whether in small businesses, they're supporting the family through holding another job of their own. And this like supporting the family, having other responsibilities supersedes like responsibilities to academics and has um, been a large reason why many Southeast Asian students have had lower graduation rates or um, degree attainment rates within higher education. So this is where C. Clare comes in. So C. Clare is one of the five student initiated student run retention projects at UCLA and is under the community programs office, which is the department that houses all of the retention projects. And CCLAIR was created as um, one of the retention projects that addresses the needs of Southeast Asian students and tries to get to provide them as many free resources as possible in order to achieve um, success in higher education, whatever that may look like for the student. And the project was created by VSU to serve the needs of the historically underrepresented Southeast Asian community. And the entire goal of CCLEAR and why I say it's a project was because CCLEAR has the mission of 100% retention of Southeast Asian students in higher education. So that means students are no longer dropping out due to um, the lack of resources, the lack of understanding of how to navigate the different education systems. And this is a project because this is something that CCLEAR and VSU, as well as the um, C and Asian American community at UCLA are striving to achieve. And once this, until this goal is achieved, then CCLA will exist as a project and continue to serve Southeast Asian students. And the re I wanted to go into this picture a little bit more and the different, the logo that CCLA has, as you've seen on like my title page, you can see that there is um, a CCLA lighthouse and as well as a lighthouse depicted here. So the reason the lighthouse was chosen as our logo just to represent and symbolize the things that we do is one, it is a tribute to our shared uh, refugee history that many Southeast Asian students share where many of their ancestors' parents have had to flee a country that was dangerous, that has full of violence on, on boats, um, just leaving the country with little idea of where to go next, where their next home will be.
And a lighthouse is something that you tend to see on a shore. It is something that is usually a guiding figure on the other side and leading you to safety. So that is kind of the idea that C. Clear wants to embody in the way that we treat our students and the way that we help our students on their academic journey. Things may seem confusing, things may seem lost in higher education, but with our programs, our workshops, our counselors, we hope to address this confusion in order to be able to guide students to what their definition of success can be. And how do we do this? We, do, we have been doing this through our five different components, internship, peer counseling, mentorship, transfer, and wellness. Um, with these five components, there's different opportunities and there's definitely something for you if you choose to um, participate in any of these C-Clear services. And you can choose how much you want to engage with the program. For example, um, we've had students who have only participated in peer counseling and um, and or mentorship. And then we have had students who wanted to participate in all five components, go to all five events. C-Clear is structured to be something for you and not to be something that is um, pressuring and just a service that is supposed to provide resources and help. So going into the different components, I wanna say first off, we have internship, which is um, actually a two unit letter grade course that can be added to uh, student schedules if they wanna join the internship class. This is a small group of 10 to 13 students each quarter who have the opportunity to learn from each other by hosting dialogue spaces. They are also developed, um, they are also developed in professional skills and leadership skills through the different workshops that they put on uh, as a group. They also get to interact with the other retention spaces which have um, which have other students of color as well. So we can learn from the narratives of each community. And the program, since it's so small, has definitely been a safe space for a lot of students to share what they have felt growing up about their personal C identity and how this has applied to them in college and what their experiences have been. And those participating on internship have opportunities to become what are called staff assistants, which are to become interns specifically for different components so that they can learn more about the other components in C-Clear, as well as um, receive guidance from our staff members in case they do want a job with us later in the future. Next, we have peer counseling, and I may be a little biased, but this is my favorite component of my picture is right there. But with peer counseling, this is one of our largest components and we serve over 600 students within peer counseling. So we have 11 trained peer counselors and by trained, I mean we are trained by CAPS, which is the psychological unit at UCLA, as well as um, CAC, which is the career academic counseling unit. I mean, the college academic counseling unit. And our peer counselors are trained to have one hour one on one sessions with students to assist with anything that the student needs, whether it be degree planning, answering questions, navigating resources at UCLA. These students are all current students as well, just one or two years older than um, the student that they're counseling in order to better connect with them and better assist them with the different things that they may need while at UCLA. And honestly, peer counseling is one of the biggest reasons why I've ended up back into this space for the last three years and why I really enjoy C Clear. Like coming into UCLA, I didn't really know anyone else, like no one from my high school, no one from my area, and everything was just foreign and new. And I ended up spending that first year, first quarter, just staying in my dorm, not really wanting to talk to anyone and being extremely shy. However, one of the peer counselors that year reached out to me and um, was able to introduce me to the space and just give me a space to talk about things that I was concerned with. And it was just really nice to have someone who also identified as Southeast Asian, specifically Vietnamese um, American, who is just who um, was able to understand my concerns as a freshman and how I had no idea what major I wanted and how to decide what uh, classes I should take. And just having this role model, having this person that I felt comfortable asking questions really helped make, make UCLA or 
and the institution itself feel a little bit closer to home. Uh, next up, we have the mentorship component, and the mentorship component aims to provide a safe space for students to grow alongside peers. So there are, we have mentor and mentee pairings where um, students can meet each other and prep each other as mentor mentee, and these students are um, connected into what is called one family unit, where they do a lot of socials, a lot of study sessions. And this is just a way for students to meet other students at UCLA, especially within the Southeast Asian community, and have more er areas and people that they can ask for advice whenever it's needed. This previous year, our mentorship component was able to onboard alumni mentors as well, where we were able to receive career advice from um, over 20 alumni mentors who paired up with different students to host workshops and uh, get to know them a little bit better. So our mentorship component, aside from partnering students up, ha has many different events. And these are just a few of the events that have happened this year. For example, there's the intro to mentorship where students were able to meet each other to prep potential mentors, mentees. And one of our proudest events this year, which is the C Clear C Activism Week. So we were able to put on an activism panel with um, community members from the Orange County and Los Angeles area who talked more about how students can get involved, especially in their um, different uh, student organizing spaces. And this was so relevant, especially during a time where the AAPI hate crimes were rising. Uh, the mentorship component also put on Career Alumni Week, which is where we receive different advice from alumni and were able to put it together in an infographic for students who weren't able to attend. Next up, we have the transfer component and the transfer component aims to support and develop transfers through um, resource based programming that helps with the transition of transfer students, as well as provide them with the resources on how to find to be successful at UCLA, especially during their limited time at the school. So they do career planning developments, post grad opportunities, they host dialogue spaces where transfer students can meet with each other and share their own experiences and collaborate with other UCLA transfer organizations. So some of the things that the transfer component participated in this year was having a dialogue space on the imposter syndrome, which is something that a lot of students um, undergo when entering UCLA. Uh, we had this huge issue with transfer housing where transfer students of the class of 2022 weren't able to assist weren't able to get housing originally. So um, the transfer component made a guideline about what is transfer housing now, which is the platform that was going on social media in order to help more people understand the issue and advocate for transfer students. And now transfer the transfer class of 2022 as a result has been able to achieve housing for the next year. And just career workshops, for example, like resume and cover letter writing. And last but not least, we have their wellness component. So the wellness component focuses a lot on um, the different areas of wellness, whether it be physical, mental, spiritual, spatial, and sexual health. And they put on workshops or what we like to call well shops, where students can talk about these things and learn more, as well as just engage with each other in different wellness practices, whether it be to de-stress or just learn more about their own personal health. Um, so some of the events that the wellness component did put on this year was um, the first one being like how to talk to your immigrant parents about mental health. So this is a workshop that really addressed some of the community conditions of Southeast Asian students. We also had a special guest come where we were able to do a workshop with Tway Bay, which is cooking with Tway Bay. So she uh, zoomed in with us and taught us all how to do a, a, a um, how to cook a dish. And for those that don't know, this is a Vietnamese American chef and uh, social media influencer. And we ended off the year with a wellness component uh, doing a Muay Thai well shop. So this, these all happened virtually and students were able to participate, whether it be through cooking, whether it be through physical activity and um, exercising, doing Muay Thai. And a lot of people had a lot of fun. 
And if any of these events did interest you or you want to know more about CClear, please feel free to scan the QR code to just join our weekly newsletter to receive updates about like any upcoming events that we have. Um, events are open to students who are not at UCLA. So if you are interested um, at any of the events or services that we provide, please feel free to let us know or just stop by at one of our events and um, meet some of our service recipients as well as staff members. Uh, if you ever do have any questions about like academics, um, once you're at UCLA, you can also sign up for a peer counselor, which is um, like I mentioned, one of the students one of the 11 trained uh, students who will be helping with professional development, giving general advice, academic planning, or just any inquiries or questions or just any concerns at all, you can also email pcc.cclear at gmail.com. I know I'm running a little bit over, but just another way to connect with us in the future. If you're ever interested in checking, um, checking out the things that we do or getting more involved or just seeing if you can stop by an event, we have a Facebook and Instagram at UCLA CClear. We have our link tree where we post up a lot of event signups as well as different resources, as well as um, our newly published website where you can find a lot more information about the things that we do. And I'll link all of these into the chat below. But thank you for hearing me and um, letting me have this space to share more about CClear. And if you do have any questions, feel free to let me know um, through the chat or um, through the different links that I'm sending. And I'll also plug my email below in case you have any general questions about UCLA or just me in general that you want to talk. Thanks so much, Annie, for sharing all that wonderful information about our retention um, programs at UCLA. So um, CClear is one, I don't remember how many we have student in initiated retention programs. Um, we have Annie. five on the retention side. Okay, so we have five student initiated retention programs all started by students. You know, these were all created by these student organizations. Um, there are quite a few um, Philippinex identified um, uh, students here on the on you know on the call. So um, I'd like to share that there's also Spear, which is kind of the counterpart to see clear that Annie's working on. So many different options, but you know all these different retention programs also welcome anybody from any community. So you can definitely work with Annie as well as the other five retention programs um, who do have the goal of ensuring that you reach this level of academic, personal, and professional success. So thank you, Annie, for your continued work, continued advocacy on campus and in the community. And um, thank you also to Dr. Buenavista for the work that you've done and just the wonderful presentation that you had about the model minority myth, helping us understand that it doesn't only hurt our communities, but other communities as well. And also for sharing your experiences. Um, we want to take this time to open it up for questions for, um, you know, if you have any questions for our two speakers here today, um, we will um, be taking a break shortly afterwards, but um, we will have uh, folks from the staff here to field any of your questions should you have any um, after uh, we have uh, questions from our, for our speakers. So you can put that on the chat or um, just raise your hands. I received a question in the chat asking if our counselors could help out with UC applications. And I just wanna preface that our student counselors um, are not trained to help out with UC applications. However, if you are interested in learning more about the college or just hearing more about their UC application experience, they would be very happy and welcoming to talk to you. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can still sign up on our interest form and we can reach out. Let me step in here for a second and just promote CCCP's work with transfer because that's exactly what we do. And we, um, <clears throat> we are actually starting a new partnership or will begin a new partnership with CClear uh, because of the work that they do with transfer students. We wanna make sure that we engage with them. So um, Aaron, uh, who was here earlier and who will be back shortly is one of our peer advisors who will be um, 
glad to help uh, on that. We will be sending everyone who participates here information about our application workshops uh, beginning soon and for the fall. And then um, let me just take this moment to ask Brandon to introduce himself because he wasn't here this morning when we first started, but he is here now. Brandon? Maybe he's not. <laughs> okay, well, you'll you'll meet him at the during the student panel. Oh, there he is. So, sorry about that. I was getting my camera set up. Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon. And your role is? Oh, my role. Um, I, I was part of the planning committee uh, for, for this webinar. I am also a fourth year, um, second year transfer at UCLA. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Melissa, take it on. <clears throat> I had a quick question for Tracy Buenavista. Yes. Hello. Hi. I mentioned earlier that um, as someone growing up in an underserved city, Long Beach, California, um, I had the pleasure of working or developing the start of, um, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank developing the start of my education and my college career, uh, John Muir Academy. And I mentioned that I was interested in starting a foundation. If um, I could drop my information so that um, I could ask for um, how you started grant writing and developing and producing for a nonprofit or foundation. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with you and continue that. Um, throughout my years as a pre-med student. Yeah, I, um, I, I'll share my email with everybody, um, but yeah, feel free to follow up my email and we can talk about that. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Well, I think we have um, email addresses of our speakers. So if you have any further questions or just curious about um, some of the things they talked about, please reach out. Um, we will be going on break but please do come back. Um, we will resume at 1245. And at the end of the program, we will have um, a raffle. So please do come back and, and learn more stuff and win some prizes and hang out with some really cool people. Um, thank you again. Um, Alfred, do you have anything else? Yes, uh, thank you, Tracy and Annie for those presentations. Um, we do appreciate uh, your being here and staying here. And um, we will stay in the room. Um, we will, uh, as Melissa said, we'll resume at 1245, but we'll be here uh, playing a little music or answering questions. If anybody has any specific questions, we have some several students who are here from uh, CCP's uh, peer advisor. So if you have specific student questions, there are people that can answer as well. And then at 12.45, we will uh, start with the uh, transfer experience and the uh, moderator presenter is Kia Tan, who is the uh, Associate Director of Diversity at UC Merced. And um, we will have Brandon, um, Aaron and Tiffany Doe, uh, who will be the panelists. And then our last session will be um, Tracy Tan, who will be talking mental health and wellness. Uh, Tracy, Tracy, I'm sorry, Tiffany Tran, um, who will be talking mental health and wellness, and then we'll end with our raffle. So make sure you stick around or come back. Thank you very much. DJ, if you are in the room.
Santi, are you here? He's probably having lunch. No, I'm here. Oh. I was, I was trying to share the music, but um, uh, yeah, I need to.